I'm Maureen Rogers, and this is Curtain Call at Laurel Mill Playhouse. And today we're very excited to have Jed Duvall as our guest. He is one half of the performing group that is called Two of Us. Now you um, sing the songs and dress as Paul McCartney, and your partner is Gene Feldman, and he um, does songs from uh, John Lennon. Right. So, what do you call yourselves? Are you a tribute artist or impersonators? I would suppose we're more tribute artists. I mean, I come from a theater background, so I, I really get into the part of Paul McCartney, and I talk like Paul McCartney, and I try to act like Paul McCartney, whereas Gene is more of a musician. Gene um, lo looks an awful lot like John Lennon, but he doesn't try to play John Lennon. He, he does a wonderful job playing the music, but he's not trying to play John Lennon. So I guess there's, there's a bit of a, a mixture of, of tribute artist and impersonator. Uh, we just look to have a lot of fun, you know. So um, when is the first time that someone said to you, Jed, you really look like Paul McCartney? You know, it's, it's the funniest thing. Um, I. As, as you know, I also perform as Elvis Presley, and I've done it ever since I was a teenager. I'd had my first show in 1981, and I stopped doing it in 1996 when I got married and started family. I came back into performing as Elvis in 2005, and at that time, I, I suppose I had matured a bit, but um, you know, I got the black hair, I got the sideburns, and yeah, I got the 50 style clothing and people were coming up to me and said, you know, you look like, and I said, well, I look like Elvis Presley. And they said, no, you look like Paul McCartney. And um, it was the first time I'd, I'd really thought about it, but I was talking to my mother about it sometime later and she said, you know what it is, I think, as you and Paul have gotten older, you're both starting to sag in the same places, and you're supposed, <laughs> both starting to get wrinkles in the same places. And I think that's why you look more like him now than you did when you were a kid. So that's the sort of thing that only a mother can get away with saying, you know. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of a, a, a weird thing. I mean, you, you idolize a fellow all your life, and I, I listen to Paul McCartney probably since the womb. And, um, you know, all of a sudden you start to look like him. I, I can't explain it, you know. <laughs> We've been fortunate to have you at Laurel Mill Playhouse as Elvis and um, the very beginnings of Paul McCartney. Right. Uh, but you've also done Johnny Cash. How did that come about? Johnny Cash, um, it, there's a bit of a, a, I'm not sure how that came about. I thought I had done the Children's Miracle Network down in um, Benefit, down in Fredericksburg, Virginia, for a couple of years. And I thought the sponsor came to me and said, I thought you, I heard you singing as Johnny Cash. We already have an Elvis. Would you like to try Johnny Cash? Now, I've talked to him since, and he said, no, you came to me and said, you know, you have a lot of Elvises. Can I do Johnny Cash? But whatever it was, I decided to do Johnny Cash for this um, Children's Miracle Network um, concert. And, you know, it, it came about just going, literally going to Goodwill and getting a black suit for $14. That's pretty good. <laughs> and, you know, learning the songs. And, and Johnny Cash was another, another um, singer, performer that I'd heard my entire life. I remember when I was about five, my dad bought my mom a brand new hi-fi for her birthday. And he also bought a stack of albums, but we could tell they were albums more for him than for my mom. Um, there was some Tom Jones and Hank Williams, and one was Johnny Cash, Live at Folsom Prison, which had just come out that year. And so that was a very exciting album for me. I mean, one of the biggest thrills about the album were all the beeps in it. I mean, Johnny cursed oh. during the... <laughs> I during didn't the, realize yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, and they were, they were, it was very mild compared to today, mm -hmm. but, you know, in 1968, Columbia felt like they had to beep them out, so it was years before I actually heard the entire recording and, and heard what he actually said. But, um, yeah, and Johnny Cash has, has been a, a favorite performer of mine as well. Well, how did you meet your partner, Gene Feldman, for two of us? How did that all start? Well, 
you know, I've, I've been doing the Paul McCartney either as a solo act or with a band called Speed of Sound for a few years now. And um, I was looking for different ways to present the solo act because the, the band was doing fine, but I, I wanted to improve on the solo act. And, and out of the blue, this was last February, I got an email from this fellow Gene saying, I've always had this idea of doing an acoustic act, a duo, with me performing as John and someone else performing as Paul, and I wondered if you'd be interested. And, you know, it was, it was during the winter, and I didn't have a lot to do, and I said, well, sure. And, you know, um, we got together, we hit it off very well. He knows an awful lot about music and an awful lot about the Beatles, and he's an, such a good guitar player. And so we, we really hit it off. And, and that's an important thing. I mean, I've, I've, I've worked with other Johns, I've worked with other people, but it's, it's very important to hit it off with the people and to be comfortable with them. And, you know, it just is an added bonus that Gene happens to look naturally like John Lennon, and he happens to be such a wonderful musician. Well, I'm looking forward to meeting him. Um, what are some of the difficult aspects of performing as a celebrity artist? You know, with, with Elvis, there are so many guys in the, in the business. It's become a business. There's a little cottage industry that's grown up around the Elvis Presley phenomena. And as it is, there, um, the standard is set so high you just can't go in with a wig that you bought at a Halloween place. You have to go in with a professionally styled wig. You have to go in with professional sideburns. You have to go in with, um, you know, there's one authorized dealer in the world for Elvis Presley jumpsuits. Oh Only goodness. one. And, and he's authorized because he had on staff Elvis's original jumpsuit designer. So, you know, people who really want to do well at what they do, they, they really spend a lot of money. I mean, a, a good jumpsuit can cost $2,000 and up. And so I know some fellows who do Elvis, they have two or 300 of these jumpsuits. So I can't even imagine what the investment is for Elvis. Now, like I said with Johnny Cash, I can go to the Goodwill and buy a $14 um, uh, black suit. With Paul McCartney, the difficulty is that Paul is still a viable act, and he changes all the time. There was a, there was a um, period of time in the, right around 2010, 2009, 2010, that he seemed to wear suspenders with every outfit he was wearing, so I invested into few pairs of suspenders. Now he rarely ever wears suspenders, which I, I'm very happy about because the suspenders I bought were the clip-on kind. And you'd be in the middle of performance and all of a sudden they'd come unclipped and hit you oh, right no. in the chin. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, um, that's the difficulty with Paul. Paul, is, he's adding new songs. He's, he's adding you know, new looks. You know, and, and so to keep up with Paul, is, that's, that's a real difficulty. How about the fans? Do they, do they really expect you to be Elvis or Paul McCartney? You know, the Elvis fans are a, a unique breed. They really are. They, um, they are well-versed on their Elvis, and they really expect you to, um, to carry that through. I mean, it, it almost seems like a few of them, Elvis's passing left such a, a gap in their life that they're almost looking to fill that gap. Now there are other fans who just want to have a good time and want to hear a guy do a good performance. And so it, it really runs the whole gamut. Um, Paul, on the other hand, um, I, I had someone come up to me and say, I don't understand why someone would go to see someone impersonating someone living that they can go and see in concert right now. And I always respond that, that um, well, you'd have to pay a lot more than $15 <laughs> to get a front seat to see Paul McCartney. So, um, 
you know, the, uh, we've had some, some fans who have been very, very into it. We've had some people who have said, well, you know, you, d you didn't do this exactly right, you didn't do that exactly right, and you had the wrong guitar, and, you know, when, if you played this certain song, you should have been playing this certain instrument. And, you know, so it's, it's a real grab bag, the fans, because some of them are just looking for a good time. Some of them um, are really looking, are studying you. I mean, I've seen them with arms crossed and <laughs> scowls on their face, and, you know, they're, they're really going through each aspect of the act. Thankfully, um, the people who come to the shows are sort of somewhere in the middle. They're looking for authenticity, but they're also looking for a good time. Have you had any performances that were, have been really funny or unusual or memorable? Two months ago, I was called by a, a group, um, a national group called the One Campaign. They do a lot of of um, benefits and a lot of work for third world hunger, especially in Africa. And they were looking for someone, their president was stepping down from his position, and they were looking for someone to sing him some Beatles songs. And the company they checked with that has a lot of vocalists, they didn't know any Beatles songs, which I find completely mind blowing. But they checked with me and they said, you know, our the president of the company is originally from Liverpool. I think it would be great if you came as Paul McCartney and sung Paul McCartney's <laughs> tunes. And so it was at an art gallery downtown DC. And I went in and as I was waiting, the fellow who was going to introduce me was on his cell phone. And he was talking and he was kind of looking up and nodding at me. And after he got off the cell phone, he came over and he said, you must be my Paul McCartney. I said, yes, I am. He said, I was just talking to Bono about you. And I said, Bono, he said, Bono with you too. I said, oh, okay, Bono with you too, of course. I, I often run into people talking on the phone with Bono of you too about me, you know. <laughs> so um, it, as it turns out, Bono is one of the chair people of of this, and um, so the fellow got up and he was giving a speech, and the girl who had who had contacted me, who had hired me, who was assistant, said, "He's a really nice guy, isn't he?" I said, "Yeah, he's very nice." She, you know, he founded MTV, <laughs> so it was a real night of I was just kind of in awe of everything that was going on. But um, yeah, you have some you have some um, memorable performances, that's for sure. I remember the first time I met you, you were in Arsenic and Old Lace. Mm -hmm. that's, been, that's been a few years back, and somebody pointed out that in your bio that you, had, that you did Elvis, and we said, well, that's great. Would you come and do a show for us? And then you've done many shows for many us. Many shows, and, many shows. And we've, we've had packed audiences and just had really a good, good time. What do you find interesting about the three people that you play? Is Paul McCartney more interesting to you um, to sing his music? You know, I, I have a real connection with Paul because I grew up listening to the Beatles constantly. My parents lived in England in the 1950s, and so they were very, especially my mom, very into things that were English. They, I mean, you know, I, I remember having a little double-decker bus when I was a kid, and we had people who were practically members of her family that they met in England that would come over and bring us gifts. And, and so we had a very English feel in our house. And um, when the Beatles came out, I was, you know, they, they recorded their first song three weeks after I was born. So I kind of grew up with Beatles songs, and I grew up with the Beatles. And then when the Beatles split up, I was a very, very big Wings fan. And so I've always been a, a very big Paul McCartney fan. So performing as Paul McCartney, I, there's a special connection there. But on the other hand, Paul is probably the most normal of the three. I mean, he he's, lives a fairly normal life. He doesn't have a lot of the idiosyncrasies that, that um, Johnny Cash or especially Elvis Presley had. Yeah. So from an acting point of view, he's, he's pretty much a normal guy. 
Now, Elvis Presley, on the other hand, Elvis Presley, um, he was an unusual guy. I mean, his, the way he lived, the way he had to live because of his, his fame. Um, I mean, he was a fellow who came from absolute nothing to be the top entertainer of an entire century, an entire generation, gen many generations. So um, he developed some quirks, to say the least. You know, you, you, you see a lot of bios and you see a lot of people claiming these unusual things that, that have to do with Elvis. Some of them I just, I kind of pass off as that's something they just put to sell a book. But then there are other things that I say, I can see that completely. You know, I can see how Elvis would develop that kind of mannerism or that kind of um, behavior because of the kind of prison that he was put in, you know. Um, playing Elvis, you know, performing as Elvis is interesting. I think if anybody wanted to do a biopic, and, and I, would, I would love to play Elvis, be Elvis, and, um, and kind of live out his life. Because it, it, there are some negative aspects, but it was such an interesting story. I mean, it almost sounds like a, a, a mythology, you know, when you talk about Elvis Presley. And then, of course, Johnny Cash, um, Joaquin Phoenix, did such a wonderful job playing Johnny Cash in 2005. And the aspects of his life, you know, are, are interesting as well. So, you know, I think as far as being connected with anyone, I was, I'm more connected with Paul McCartney. As, as far as having a very interesting backstory, I think Elvis and Johnny Cash have Paul beat a bit. Of course, once Paul is no longer with us and, you know, all these skeletons come out of the closet, who knows what we might find. <laughs> so true. <laughs> we know every girl in the 60s had their favorite Beatle, and um, Paul McCartney was my favorite okay. Beatle. So do you get people coming up and telling you that? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, and a majority of them, Paul um, is their favorite. I grew up, my, I have a sister who's five years older. So she was about six when the Beatle, when Beatlemania started. And my aunt, who lived next door to me, was about 11 or 12 when the Beatlemania started. And both of them were Paul freaks, just Paul freaks, and, you know, had all the memorabilia. And, of course, you know, I looked up to these, these girls and wanted to hang out with them. And, and I was a, a little guy, so, of course, I started liking Paul, too. But... Um, you know, he, he was the best looking one. I'm sorry. <laughs> he was, he, <laughs> he was. was the best He did looking. seem like the most normal, like you say. Right, right. Um, I had the opportunity to see Paul McCartney not too long ago mm -hmm. at, at the Verizon Center. And what surprised me is I don't listen to the music as much as I did back in the, back in the 60s. But all those words came back to me. It had been ingrained in my head. Mm -hmm. So do you have a lot of people that are singing along with you oh, at the that's, concerts? Oh, that's <laughs> the most wonderful thing. I mean, um, for example, at the Laurel Mill Playhouse, um, it's, it's a playhouse. It's a place for theater. And most people say, well, we're going to the theater and we're going to have the fourth wall there. And we're not allowed to make any noise because it will distract them. And that's, this, this, is, this is a concert. This is a performance. This is a show. So we encourage people to you know, sing along, stand up, clap along. They can, if, they want to, um, um, if they want to dance, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's places they can dance. <laughs> We did have some dancers <laughs> we, one time. <laughs> But yeah, we we very much encourage people to um, to just sing along and and have a great time. Yeah, you know? it it always has been. If you had a couple of things to tell people that uh, like why they should come and see your show with Gene, what would you tell them? Well, John and Paul never really had a a duo sort of act. You couldn't really go out and see John and Paul play together. Now the closest anyone ever came was, it's an interesting story. It's sort of the way we kind of based our show. Back in 1976, there was a big push to get the Beatles back together. And I think there was someone in Asia who had offered them $1.5 million 
some, some astronomical figure to get them together. And um, Lauren Michaels of Saturday Night Live came on the show one day and made a public announcement straight to the camera. He looked straight at the camera and he said, I know a lot of people want to get, to get the Beatles back together. I'm here to offer a grand sum of $3,000 if they will come and play on the show. Well, it was all a big joke because, you know, apparently Lorne Michaels couldn't afford a lot of money. But what he didn't realize was that John and Paul had watched the program or were somewhere, some, somehow they were aware of the program. And they had decided, since they were, you know, Paul, uh, John's apartment was 20 blocks away, let's catch a cab, go down there and just show up and do some, <laughs> some songs together. And yeah, I could use $1,500, you know, couldn't you? So, um, but it never came about, and Paul says later, it never came about because we just started doing the other things. We were too lazy to go downtown. So um, what the premise of our show is, what if John and Paul somehow got together, just the two of them and their instruments, and just very stripped down versions of the songs that everyone knows and loves, you know? So um, that's, that's why I would, I would come to the show. I mean, there are a lot of Beatle tribute acts, and you can see the Beatles almost just the way they were on the Ed Sullivan show. But there's not a lot of places you can go and just see two guys sitting with basic instruments doing the songs that you grew up with and you, you, you hopefully love or at least are familiar with. It brings you back to another time, you know. Kind of like the coffee house in Liverpool, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, we are so looking forward to having you and Jean at Laurel Mill Playhouse, and I invite everybody to come and see that. And that will be Friday and Saturday, October 7th and 8th at 8 p.m., and uh, Sunday, October the 9th at 2 p.m. You need to purchase your tickets ahead of time, and you can do that by going to our website, which is www.laurelmillplayhouse.org. You just look up Laurel Mill Playhouse, you'll find it, and uh, you'll find that you click on that page and you can purchase your tickets. They are just $15, and this helps support Laurel Mill Playhouse, your community theater um, in Laurel. You can also check what is going on with Laurel Mill Playhouse, including two of us, with uh, Jed and Jean, on our Facebook page, Laurel Mill Playhouse. We're located at 508 Main Street. So check that out and uh, become a member uh, of our Facebook page. We hope to see you at the show on October 7th, 8th, and 9th. But if you can't make it, we're doing other shows, Gene and I, as two of us. You can see us on our Facebook page. It's www.facebook.com slash two of us tribute. That's two of us tribute. We hope to see you soon. If you have any questions uh, about the show, uh, please give me a call. You can reach me at 301-452-2557. Again, that's 301-452-2557. I hope to see you there. I'll be screaming along. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jed. I so Thank appreciate you so your much. coming out to do this with us. Thank you. It was wonderful to be here.